It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce my friend and personal hero, Alaska's Dune Lankard, an Eak Athabascan native of the Eagle Clan. Dune has founded and co-founded several key organizations, including the EAC Preservation Council and Native Conservancy. His tireless strategies have helped win the preservation of more than 1 million acres of wild salmon habitat in the Exxon Valdez spill zone. Dune has received wide recognition for his leadership, including as one of Time Magazine's Top 50 Heroes for the Planet, Prime Movers Award, and fellowships with the Ashoka Foundation and Future of Fish. Dune is now venturing into kelp farming in the Prince William Sound for restoration, growing traditional food sources, and for building regenerative economies and resiliency for our ocean and coastal communities. His talk is titled Kelp and Coal. It will be in the discussion circle later today of climate resiliency. Dune will be sharing more about his work to build community and to drive action for climate resiliency. Uh, my name is Dune Lankard. I'm an EAC Athabascan Indian from the Copper River Delta in Prince William Sound in Alaska. And my EAC name is Jamutsuki. Uh, that means little bird that screams really loud and won't shut up. And I was given that name shortly after the Exxon Valdez oil spill happened in my backyard. Um, otherwise, no one would probably know my name right now. Um, <clears throat> my uh, clan is Eagle Clan. Uh, we have the eagles and the ravens. And at one time, we had uh, the wolf and the bear clans, much like the Clinket Athabascan people. Uh, we originally had come out of the interior of Alaska uh, 3,500 years ago and came across the glaciers down to the coastline in the Gulf of Alaska. And we landed in this place uh, called Yakutat, which one of the Eak uh, names um, for Yakutat or meanings is uh, where the canoes rest or the lagoon behind the sea. And uh, there we encountered uh, other uh, warring tribes, the Chugash Eskimos and the Aleut, and the Clinket came to our rescue in exchange for uh, helping our EAC people because we are both of Athabascan descent. Uh, we had to give up our women. And so in exchange um, for protection, uh, we have had to give up some powerful, amazing EAC women. And we got tired of that, so we fled across the Delta 300 miles to what is now known as Cordova, uh, where we live now. And we figured we'd start camping there till it quit raining, and that was 3,500 years ago. And that's who I am. The um, The world that we're in right now uh, is a time of uh, a global pandemic of uh, climate change beyond belief and civil unrest. And <clears throat> what happens when moments like that happen in time, our leaders seem to lose their wisdom and make decisions that aren't in the best interest of the planet or the people. And so much like when the Exxon Valdez oil spill happened in our backyard, uh, everyone uh, lost their minds. They, they lost their wisdom. Uh, they wanted to develop everything they possibly could in order for us to continue to survive. At the time that um, the prices of salmon were plummeting, the values of our fishing permits plummeted. The values of our boats uh, went down. Uh, people were struggling socially. Uh, there was uh, drug and alcohol abuse. There was divorces. There was fishing partnerships breaking apart that were together for 15, 20, 25 years or more. Uh, there was a lot of duress. And this was at the time that 
Exxon was telling us that, you know, we're Exxon, we do it right. We're going to make you whole again. In the meantime, they had um, actually appealed the verdict that we won in 1994 uh, of $5 billion. They appealed that 17 times until they got the Supremes of their dreams to take the case not to set a precedent or to make sure that justice was served, but to make sure that just us was server, served. And what that meant for us was that we are on our own. And so all these development projects started happening. Uh, we took on, we, our EAC Preservation Council took on 37 major environmental battles. And thank God we won 35 of those. We filed dozens of lawsuits, did everything we possibly could to keep our place wild and roadless and pristine. And in the meantime, uh, as, as everything was, was starting to fall around us, or, or at least uh, people wanted to figure out how they were going to diversify the lost economy of fishing with all of this other development, there was this idea to build a road across the Copper River Delta, a 55 mile road. And so Don Young, the Alaska Congressman, uh, introduced what he called the Chugash Road Rider. And it was gonna be a 55 mile road being built across pristine wilderness of the Copper River Delta, uh, 500 feet wide, five times federal standard, uh, no environmental impact statements, no environmental assessments, no restoration bonds. Uh, it would have destroyed the Delta. It would have been a slow moving oil spill across the Copper River Delta. And so we went out and, <clears throat> and arrested this first bridge that they wanted to build across Clear Creek. And, and I realized at that moment that if this road was ever built, there would be a deep water port built in Cordova, a port of extraction, turning Cordova into a port city. They would build this 55 mile road across the Delta. And what it would do is it would then open up clear cutting, more clear cutting, strip mining uh, for coal and other minerals. Uh, there was planned oil and gas drilling onshore and offshore. Uh, and it would have linked up a lot of other development projects. And so to me, at that moment in time, I realized that we had to do everything in our power if we were going to keep this place somewhat pristine and a home for the salmon to come home to, that we had to keep the coal in the ground. We had to figure out how to keep the coal in the ground. And this was a, a tall order because in every other place, um, you know, uh, they've been able to figure out how to uh, mine the wealth uh, right out of the villages and the communities and, and take our way of life from us. Alaska historically has been a natural resource extraction state. And so when I, you look back in the history of territorial days through statehood, uh, when they founded oil, the reason there was a land claim settlement for the Indian people, because there was an Indian problem. How did they get to the oil without settling the land claims for the native peoples? And so uh, the oil companies uh, and the uh, federal government came up with $900 million to basically pay for the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. And the native peoples, uh, we owned the entire state then. We owned all 380 million acres. At the end of the day, we ended up only preserving 11% in native ownership. So 44 million acres was retained out of 380 million. So our lives have always been under attack. We've always uh, had to adjust to politics and, and destruction around us. And so I just decided after the oil spill that I would had enough, that it was the day to me that the ocean had died, but yet something inside of me came to life. And I realized that I needed to be louder than everything else, but yet remain a voice of reason 
so people would listen. And so I said, let's take on all the powers that be, bring them on. The uh, most of the restoration uh, since the oil spill uh, has been in the form of, of preserving equivalent habitat uh, to the best of our abilities. And what I mean by that is there was no way, once the oil hit the water, the war was over, we lost. There was no way to clean it up. Uh, you know, the number one uh, response to oil spills today is dispersants. <clears throat> Dump it on the oil, sink it into the water column, get it out of the public view uh, and call it good and get ready for lawsuits. Um, the best thing and the only thing that we could have done was to try and save as much equivalent pristine habitat so the 27 most heavily impacted species had somewhere to call home and somewhere to recover. And that was, uh, you know, saving uh, over a million acres of habitat in the spill zone that was scheduled to be clear cut. And then uh, about 400 million was spent on science that basically showed that oil and water don't mix. And I felt like, you know, if we're gonna have any chance of, of restoration, that we had to do a number of things. We had to stab off the development um, and the, the enclave of, de of developers that wanted to clear cut, strip mine, oil drill, uh, you know, build ports. Uh, right now in the Copper River Delta, we're still facing the road across the Delta. There's still plans of mining the Bering River coal field. The military through the Air Force and the Navy are still bombing the Gulf of Alaska and their training programs. This year, they start May 3rd to May 14th. Our Copper River fishery opens on May 18th. In the last three years, uh, to give you some idea, uh, on an average normal run, we would have one to two million sockeye salmon, red salmon, return to the Copper River Delta annually. Three years ago, only 44,000 sockeyes came home. The year after that, uh, the ocean heated up to 76 degrees down the 20 feet below the surface, killing literally millions of krill, mussels, uh, wild kelp forests, uh, salmon and birds. Last year, only 85,000 sockeyes came home. And so whatever form of restoration that we can do uh, is, is needed and necessary right now. Uh, going back to the Copper River Delta, you know, there's plans to start mining uh, underneath the glaciers as they're receding because of climate change. In Alaska, uh, our sea ice, our permafrost, and our glaciers are melting at unprecedented rates because we are colder than other states and other regions. Uh, there's still plans by the Alaska Mental Health Trust to mine 30 to 45 miles of our beaches right down to the waterline to take the minerals out. And so, you know, anything that we can do uh, to stop these development projects and figure out how we're going to preserve what's left is critical because the only way that you can have restoration of any kind, whether it's language preservation, wild salmon habitat, uh, uh, restoration uh, is, Preserve what you already have. Protect what you still have that's intact, still wild, still pristine, still roadless. And so that is our goal you know, on the Copper River Delta is to preserve everything that we possibly can. And by purchasing uh, the last 11,000 acres of the Bering River coal field on the Eastern Delta uh, will lead to the preservation of over 3 million acres of habitat that will remain roadless. Three years ago in 2016, our EAC Preservation Council and Native Conservancy uh, preserved 85% of the coal fields uh, where a conservation easement uh, will be in perpetuity on that other 85% of coal. And so we, we just have to, you know, as a human race, uh, we, we have to do things differently we must all rise on the same tide. We have to figure out how we're going to 
make a difference in the world. And what it comes down to is we are the ones who need to make that difference. And so when I think about the work going forward on what we need to do, uh, we're going to do cultural GIS mapping. We're looking at, uh, you know, figuring out how we can take our traditional place names and bring them back to life. Uh, that'll lead to recognition. It'll lead to a land claims. It'll lead to permanent protection of habitat. Uh, we want to figure out how we can restore the ocean, like one of the most uh, heavily impacted species that is on the endangered species list right now, besides the marble murrelet, the pigeon guillemot, and the AT1 res resident killer whale pod, is the Pacific herring. We once had 200,000 ton of herring returning to Prince William Sound annually. It used to be 50% of our annual income from that fishery alone. And that collapsed after the Exxon spill. It went down as low as 4,000 ton returning. And now last year and this year, uh, last year was about 18,000 ton came back. Uh, hopefully 20,000 or more will come back this year. But what it comes down to is what age class is coming back and, and you know, are they able to spawn? And what we've been finding from visual and, and I have friends out on the water right now, there is a lot of spawn uh, that they're seeing visually from the air and in the water, which is a good thing. But here's the thing, they have a, a disease that they had taken on after the spill and it's, it's killing them. You have uh, lacer lacerations and lesions uh, that are impacting these herring. And, and if, if the herring recover, uh, the 27 most heavily impacted species from the spill will recover. The people will recover. And, and the herring right now, what we're thinking is if we can grow restorative kelp forests in, in the water through our kelp farming, that it'll be uh, about regeneration. It'll be about uh, preserving the habitat and talking with other indigenous peoples. There's 21 tribes now that are interested in uh, kelp and mariculture farming. Uh, they are interested for three reasons. They want to restore the ocean. They want to be able to feed their people a traditional food source because we've been uh, enjoying uh, uh, kelp, harvesting kelp and herring roe on kelp for over 2,000 years as indigenous peoples along the coast. And the third is that they want to form a regenerative economy. And what's wonderful about that is a dear friend of ours from Alaska Conservation Foundation, uh, Michael Barber said, what you're doing here doing is you're starting a regenerative economy based on conservation, restoration and mitigation, not extraction. That'll be a first in Alaska's history. And so I feel like we're on the right track. We just have to figure out how to keep the coal in the ground and get more kelp in the water. What, one of the things uh, about kelp that people need to understand is kelp can sequester carbon five to 20 times more than actual living terrestrial forests. And bivalves, uh, which are mariculture, uh, which is, um, you know, mussels, clams, scallops, oysters, they can filter upwards of 40 to 60 gallons each per day. And this is a, a resource as a commercial fisherman, I fished my whole life. And when I go out to sea, I'm actually, uh, I have to think like a fish. I have to figure out how I'm going to, uh, you know, be able to chase this fish around and, and chase it down and, and figure out how to catch it. Where with kelp, uh, you don't have to feed it. You don't have to water it. You don't have to fertilize it. Uh, you don't have to chase it around. Uh, you just grow it. And if you're able to grow it in volume, uh, then you'll be able to, uh, you know, figure out how to uh, get more carbon sequestration. And, and here's the thing. We need to come up with community-driven solutions that actually create green jobs, in our case, blue jobs, uh, and, and figure out how we're going to 
uh, start a new relationship with our traditional food sources. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, most people, especially in cities, uh, like right now, I'm, I'm here in San Francisco, uh, you know, doing some fundraising and working with our ED, uh, our, our, excuse me, our vice president, uh, Evelyn, and I subsist in the grocery stores. You know, you, you have a different way of life here in America, where in Alaska, we're still able to live from the land and the sea. And because of climate change, because of what's happening to our lands and oceans, uh, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to be able to grow our own food sources, whether it's on the land or in the ocean. Uh, we need to figure out how we're going to process our own food. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how to <clears throat> value add those resources and, and be able to sell those products direct. And I remember about 15 years ago, I was reading this one article about the future of the internet and future of, of uh, the world. And, and it, at one point, this one uh, person said something to the effect of, well, you know, the people who are going to survive in this new world order because it, we're going to have less are the ones who network, who have social networks. Uh, you know, we're going to have to be able to have our own uh, pods and, and, and groups that we huddle with that we're able to network with and share food and stories and energy and, and, and be able to direct energy, time, money, and love, whatever direction that we need to. But it has to be with a network of people. And so I realized, you know, I needed to uh, figure out how Facebook worked and figure out how to get on LinkedIn. You know, I, I figured I, I had to, uh, figure this out, how I was going to be able to communicate with people. Because for us right now, uh, it really comes down to uh, creating food sovereignty and food security programs that are based on being regenerative. Because if it's not regenerative, just don't do it. We need to uh, figure out how we're going to uh, grow a food source that can help take care of our people and, and take care of our planet. And so I'm really excited about kelp um, and, and mariculture because I feel like uh, with ocean acidification, uh, with the blob, which is the warming of the ocean like we had a couple years ago, uh, and with ocean rise, there's 31 villages that have to be relocated in Alaska right now today. There's 125 villages behind them that are going to have to be relocated. And so, uh, you know, we have to, you know, figure this out real quickly. Uh, you know, how are we going to feed our people? How are we going to take care of ourselves? How are we going to, you know, live from the land and the sea in the future? And so that means, you know, uh, thinking smarter, being smarter, acting smarter. Uh, and it could be as simple as uh, you get better long-term loans to build homes that are on stilts or uh, that are on barges, you know? So when the incoming tide comes in, you're able to float away to higher ground. Or if you're gonna build houses, you know, on wheels, you can just hook it up to a, a truck and drive it to higher ground. And so uh, then, what happens is you get better interest rates because you're building smart buildings. You're building, you know, getting ready for climate change and, and these uh, catastrophes that are going to happen over and over. And, and here's the thing. Collectively, we have the intelligence. We're smart enough to figure this out. Uh, but, you know, when we build resiliency, uh, like, for example, the uh, my people in Prince William Sound, in 1964, on Good Friday, uh, March 27th, uh, we had the 9.4 uh, Good Friday earthquake that rocked our world and rocked our fisheries. And, and, and it took 25 years for those fish to start coming back, for us to start making a, a better living in the sea again. And then on the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday quake, <clears throat> we had the Exxon Valdez oil spill happen in the same region in our backyard in Prince William Sound. 
So again, our world was rocked. Again, our way of life changed. But then the after 25 years, the ocean started recovering, the fishery started coming back, our crustaceans made a recovery, our king crab were coming back, our, our uh, spotted shrimp, uh, our, our dungeon nests, our tanner crab uh, started to rebound. And then 25 years later, we have climate change. So, you know, we have to evolve, we have to adapt, we have to be resilient, but we also have to be smarter and, and we're capable. But do we have the courage to do it now? That's the question. When I first started out uh, saving habitat, and uh, you know we we can't uh, believe that we know everything, and we can't uh, you know rely on our current leaders because they clearly have lost their wisdom on so many levels. And so I realized that I was going into this space of conservation of habitat restoration. Uh, of being a, an activist. And so uh, I didn't quite know how to do that. You know, I found one book at the time, The Monkey Wrench Gang, uh, you know, about d uh, direct action. Uh, there weren't a lot of books out there that, that could help people like me that wanted to defend my homelands from all the powers that be, including, you know, our own people, native corporations that wanted to clear cut the parallel path of the Exxon Valdez. And so I went down to Eak Lake and uh, it was uh, in September, it was uh, uh, cold, it was uh, foggy, it was drizzly, it was raining that evening. And uh, I went down because I knew the next day I was gonna go uh, and speak to the highest levels of ocean government, the Exxon Valdez Wilsonville Trustee Council and give my first presentation. And so I decided to go down uh, to the lake and, and talk to my ancestors. And I got down there and uh, it was starting to rain harder and, and I was getting more frustrated because I needed to see some sign. I needed to understand, uh, am I on the right path? Am I doing the right thing? Uh, do I have the wisdom and the courage to step up and be heard? And after about an hour of venting, high in the sky, the clouds started to part. And as the clouds st started to part, I saw Eak Mountain, this pyramid in the background, the silhouette of it. And I was like, okay, this is getting better. And then, uh, the Northern Lights, this beautiful chartreuse green started dancing behind the uh, Eak Mountain. And, and, and I realized that it was just transcending. And then the green from the Northern Lights filled this cloud, this circle, and it was a green halo in the sky. And to me, I was asking, I was just venting just right before that, I need to see a green arrow in the sky. I need to know that I'm on the right path and I need to see it now. And so then as this halo filled up with this chartreuse translucent green, it shot down to the water and it came across and shimmers across to me. And I was like, oh my God, this is stunning. And at that time, silver salmon started jumping five, six, seven at a time right in front of me. And, and I was watching these ripples in the water and the splash and I could hear them. And then all of a sudden an eagle flew over the top of my head and shrieked. And I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And I looked up into the sky and I said, now that I have your attention. And I went off for another hour and I said, this is the deal. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. And I don't know what I'm gonna say. And I'm gonna go in there with a blank piece of paper. And if you have anything that you want to share in the history of time, anything that you've ever felt or wanted to say, then use me as a conduit. Use me as a voice to speak through. 
and I will deliver your message because I'm going in with a blank piece of paper and it's all you. And then I went, um, you know, I flew uh, first thing in the morning on, on the 7 a.m. flight. I flew up to Anchorage and uh, I get into the room and my sister Pamela's with me and we go up and we sit down and, and um, she says, you know, is, is that your speech in front of you? I said, it is. I said, but don't let them see it. And she goes, okay. So she lifts it up and she sees it's blank on both sides. And she said, Dune, I think you brought the wrong presentation. And I said, no, um, actually the ancestors are going to show up today, Pamela. And uh, they're going to speak through me. And so it's, it's all on them this morning. And she was just terrified. And I said, we're going to be okay. And her hands and my hands started, you know, getting a little slippery. We were worried. And I could feel, a, 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 you know, my face starting to, you know, get a little bit hot. You know, I was like, okay, well, are they going to show up or what? And um, then the highest levels of government, you know, pile into the room and all their attorneys and 30, 40 people, you know, uh, get up in front of us. And I'm the first one to speak and I'm sitting there in the booth and waiting. And, and uh, so then I just start speaking and um, you're only allowed three minutes. Well, the next three people behind me gave me their three minutes and they said, we uh, will let Mr. Lankard speak in our behalf as well. And so I was able to get 12 minutes and I got a standing ovation and uh, I went to the back of the room and, and the, one of the lead attorneys came back and she said, you know, we'd uh, really like a copy of your presentation for the public record. And I handed her this blank piece of paper and she said, it, this is it? And I said, it is. And she said, well, that was one of the most amazing presentations I've ever heard. And I would liken that to when Chief Seattle lost his land. And I said, you know, I'm going to take that as a compliment. And I realized that at that point that we just have to ask our ancestors for help, that we just have to have the belief that we don't know at all and understand that it's okay to ask for help and guidance during these times. And the ancestors will come to us. They will share their knowledge. They will share their words and their history and Pamela, when we ended that meeting, she said, Dune, there was standing room only for the thousand plus EACs uh, that were ever uh, living on the Copper River Delta. All thousand of them were in this room today, standing room only, cheering you on. And so I realized that at that point, I can do this. You know, I just, I just have to uh, believe uh, that when we ask, our, our prayers will be answered. And so we have to be the ones who imagine the world that we want to live in and visualize that and then manifest it because it really does come down to us because we're the best we got. And we have to go forward and we have to move quickly and we have to show up. We have to take action. I think that uh if we can you know find the courage to uh say the right prayers and uh and everybody has their way uh you know for me i i write them down and and then i have a burning ceremony and i i get my uh my dreams and my prayers and my vision out there into the universe and then uh as individuals, <clears throat> we have to then prepare. Uh, uh, and what I mean by that is, is number one, we have to believe that uh, we deserve help, that we deserve for our prayers to come true and that we're worthy. So, so we, we have to believe in our vision and our mission. Um, and then the second thing that you have to do is you have to prepare to receive that dream or that prayer uh, because when it's answered uh that's when the work begins um uh, because 
uh, when, when I think about, um, you know, my life and my work and, and uh, uh, inspiring others to take action is that, uh, you know, I remember who I am. I remember where I am. Uh, I remember what I have to do. And it usually starts with what I have in my hand. And in my hand, I usually have these Copper River stones. Uh, everywhere I go, uh, we've rafted the Copper River, you know, probably 75 times or more. And there are some of the most magical sacred stones uh, anywhere on the planet. And so I gather them and I give them away to different people in my networks. And, um, but I always have one in my pocket. So when I get scared or I get nervous or I wonder, you know, like, what am I gonna say? And who's gonna listen? And uh, I'll have this uh, stone uh, in my pocket and I'll grab it. And then I'll remember exactly who I am and where I'm from and what I have to say, what I need to share, what you need to hear. And, you know, and it's like when I think about, uh, you know, the future and how we're going to feed ourselves, uh, we're not going to be able to eat money. And so people are going to have to figure out how they're going to grow their food sources. And I remember um, a dear friend, Dr. Elizabeth Hoover, uh, when I had gone to hear her speak several years ago, and she's helping on our food sovereignty program and getting the kelp in the water. She said to me, that she'd written this article and it was titled something like, how can you call yourself sovereign if you can't feed yourself? And I was like, oh my God, you know, this is absolutely true is, is we are going to have to figure out how to feed ourselves. And then shortly after that, one of our board members, Winona LaDuke had come to Alaska and had given a whole presentation on her food systems approach and her, food security program. And, and, and that's what we need to do. We need to figure out how we can uh, uh, process and, and value out and, and take care of our food, grow it ourselves, process it, be able to uh, feed our people ourselves. And, and so uh, we're going to you know, have to design portable and affordable uh, processing spaces, whether it's for freezing for uh, community kitchens, for uh, kelp seed nurseries, whatever it is, we're gonna have to uh, scale up by scaling down. We're gonna have to think about, um, you know, how we're going to be able to take care of our families and take care of our villages and take care of our people on a smaller scale. Because at the end of the day, there's gonna be less and there's gonna be more chaos but we just need to remember that the Chinese symbol for change is when chaos and opportunity are coming together. And we also have to remember that we are the outliers. We are the ones who are going to make that difference. And if we're going to survive as a human race, then we have to believe in, in something more that's in our minds. We have to believe in the creator. We have to believe in this ancient wisdom we have to think about uh, being resilient, being regenerative, and being restorative every single moment of our life. I, I guess, you know, my, my closing thoughts are that, you know, we as a uh, human race are going to perish if we stay on the path that we're on. And, you know, where if we, uh, you know, take our collective wisdom and knowledge and, and expertise in all these areas uh, that are presenting themselves around the world that are about, you know, bringing renewable energy uh, into our life because, you know, as, as important as food is, uh, so is how we're going to create these new energy systems. Uh, and, and the models do exist. Uh, nobody's figured out how to stop the sun from coming out every day. Nobody's figured out how to stop the wind from blowing. Nobody has figured out how to stop the tides from rising and falling. And so we can use all of that energy that's natural 
uh, to power this dream and these visions that we have for this new world order. Uh, because if we're going to survive, uh, we're going to have to go back in time and we're going to have to fast forward and think about the seven generations behind us and the seventh generations in front of us, because they're the ones who are going to inherit the bad decision debt that we're, we make today. They're the ones who are going to uh, inherit uh, the world that we leave them. And I have a 10 year old daughter, Ananda, who I think about every day and I think about what I'm going to leave her. And I just apologize every day. I said, honey, I am so sorry that we are leaving this world to you, but I'm going to do everything in my power to leave you with choices, to leave you with some opportunity. Like my mother and father left me like their parents left them. And the only way that that's going to happen is if we have the courage to stand up and face the powers that be and groom new leaders for these new times. And we're not talking about leaders that keep thinking that politics uh, can continue the way that they do. If we're going to survive, then we're going to have to demand that new leaders step up. And, and those may be the youth. Those may be the ones who uh, we groom. But we have to do this together and we can't do it alone. And so that means setting our political differences aside and figuring out, a, out as a human race how we're gonna survive going forward. Thank you.